Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Third Class Mark Tang. It is my privilege to welcome you to the 31st Annual National Character and Leadership Symposium, and specifically, the Falcon Foundation Keynote Lecture. Please join me in recognizing our generous sponsor, the Falcon Foundation. Our honored guest speaker for this afternoon's keynote session is Mr. Scott Kirby. Scott Kirby is the Chief Executive Officer of United Airlines and a renowned graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, Class of 1989. He has had over three decades of experience in the airline industry. He assumed the role of CEO in 2020 amid the unprecedented challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Under his leadership, United Airlines made strategic investments to execute the company's vision, including a United Next Growth Plan, a commitment to be 100% green by 2050 without relying on traditional carbon offsets. United Airlines' plan also includes initiatives focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion, such as the opening of the United Aviate Academy. This initiative aims to train approximately 5,000 new pilots by 2030, with the goal of at least half being women or people of color. Prior to United Airlines, Kirby's 30-year career in aviation included time at US Airways and American Airlines, where he also served in presidential roles. He is data-driven, focused on strategy, and motivated by culture and people. Kirby is a well-known industry veteran who can navigate uncertain times and has a bold vision for establishing United Airlines as a top airline in the history of aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Scott Kirby and our cadet moderator, Cadet Second Class, Weiss Yuan. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Falcon Foundation Bud Breckler Keynote Lecture. We're here today to talk about culture, flying, leadership, and the future of aviation with the CEO of United Airlines, Scott Kirby, a 1989 graduate of the US Air Force Academy. So my first question for you is, you had ambitions to become a fighter pilot and astronaut. <laughs> I did. How did you figure out that this wasn't for you? You know, I, uh, I, I decided I wanted to be a pilot young uh, and thought I'd be a fighter pilot and then an astronaut, and so I set my sights on the Air Force Academy uh, and came here, although uh, interestingly enough, the very first time in my life I stepped foot on an airplane was when I got on an airplane to fly to the Air Force Academy. Uh, but while here, I also got to, uh, you know, in the programs that all the cadets get to do where you go off to bases, I got to fly in F-4s out of the Gulf of Mexico and we did dogfighting and all kinds of cool stuff and I thought it was great. But then the, uh, the pilot said, close your eyes and fly straight and level. Um, and I was at a 30 degree left bank. Um, it felt like I was straight and level, but uh, that's what, and then he said, use the instruments. And I got straight and level and I felt like I was gonna fall out of my seat to the right. And he laughed at me and he said, well, you're gonna be a cargo pilot. You'll never fly fighter aircraft. And, at the, and I thought at the time, it was a, I, mean, I sort of I made him change my mind. Like, you, I'm certain, are right about the second thing, but you're wrong about the first one. I'm going to do something else, and that's what I did. So was becoming the CEO of a major airline the next obvious career path? Uh, it wasn't an obvious career path. Um, I really never, and actually it's the advice that I give to people on when they talk about, uh, you know, what do you do for a career? How do you have a plan? Uh, I tell people you don't have a plan. Um, because if you have a plan, you'll miss every opportunity that comes up in front of you. And my plan was to be a... A, a pilot, um, but then when I decided not to, I got, I, I think, probably the coolest job. I got to go work for one of the undersecretaries of defense at the Pentagon as a second lieutenant that anyone could have. But if I had set my sights on just being a pilot, I would have missed that. And every other, every big decision, every change that I made in my life was something that came out of left field that I wasn't expecting 24 hours before. Um, and if you have too much of a plan, you're not open to those opportunities. I just kept trying to do things. Uh, that I enjoyed um, that were bigger opportunities um, and they just kept presenting themselves and you jump on them. Uh, and if you do that, um, you know, things are going to do well. The other point of advice I'd give to people 
is do things that you enjoy. Um, I've never felt like I had a job. Um, I've liked everything I've done. Um, if, you're worried, if you're watching the clock and not enjoying what you're doing, you're not going to be good at it. If you love it, you're going to be great. So you were supposed to become the CEO of American Airlines, uh, but, but then you became the CEO of United Airlines. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I told happened? you the story backstage. Um, so uh, I've been in the industry for a long time. Um, this, uh, I've been the president of a smaller airline, America West Airlines, which was probably the 150th largest airline in the world. Um, we were pretty aggressive. We acquired U.S. Airways when they were in bankruptcy and um, almost quadrupled the size. Then American Airlines filed bankruptcy, and um, we did a hostile bid um, to go after American Airlines, who was triple our size. Um, and so we went from this little airline, America West, <clears throat> to being uh, the biggest airline in the world um, all of a sudden. And uh, it was just super fun. Um, but I was the president, um, and I had worked for Doug Parker, who was the CEO. We'd been together for 20 years, personal friends. We, our kids grew up together. We used to go to Disney together. Um, and he brought me into, asked me to go to dinner one time with a couple of board members and said, and I'd been getting recruited to go to other companies, um, and so our board knew that. Uh, and they didn't want me to leave. And so he said, Doug has agreed he'll retire on this date, um, and all we ask from you is a commitment that you'll stay until then. And if you say yes, then we'll make you the CEO on this date. And so I, of course, said I'm honored, um, and yes, I'll do it. Um, and... Uh, and, th but th and three months later, um, Doug, who was my boss and had been my friend for 20-something years, walked in and said, he was reading, his hands were shaking, and he was reading the piece of paper, and the, the, what he read said, uh, I've changed my mind, I don't want to retire, um, and because of that, uh, you and I can't work together anymore. Um, he didn't actually say you're fired, but that's what it meant. <laughs> um, and uh, 29 days later, I was uh, the president of United Airlines, and... Uh, with a plan to be the CEO, and um, it's another one of those, you know, it came completely out of left field. Uh, it wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, but if you bounce back quick, um, you can have great opportunities, and it's turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me, because I'm having a blast at United. So I want to talk a bit about the, the airline industry. It's been more than 100 years since the first commercial flight. Where do you see the future of the airline industry, and do you ever see commercial super, supersonic flight yeah. coming back? Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, it, in, in a lot of ways, it's going to continue to evolve as opposed to revolutionize, um, unless somebody invents a transporter, uh, which I hope they don't, because we'll be in trouble if they do. Um, but uh, for, for things like supersonic, um, obviously the technology exists. Um, United Airlines has lost a launch customer for supersonic aircraft with, with boom. The question is, can they make it work economically? The technology... You know, we've been building supersonic aircraft for 60 or more, you know, all the way back to the 40s for almost 80 years now. So we know how to fly supersonic, but can you make it work economically? And that's an open question. Um, if it happens, United will be the first airline uh, to, to fly the airplanes. Um, we're also, it's fun because we're getting to be kind of on the ground floor helping design the airplane, build the airplane, um, if, it, if it's going to happen. Um, I will say the company's called Boom um, Supersonic. Some of you probably follow it and know something about it. Um, they have great engineers. The first time I met Blake, who's their CEO, um, we'd done a bunch of engineering vetting and um, thought the airplane made sense. And I told him, you need some help with marketing. And he said, what do you mean? Like, so you can't call an airplane company boom. And he's like, no, 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 you understand, sonic boom. I'm like, I get it, Blake, but you don't call airplanes boom. <laughs> um, but anyway, we'll see if it, if it happens. What I will think is, what I do think is going to happen um, is... Um, uh, United Airlines is going to be, uh, well, we're already the biggest airline in the world, but we're going to be the best. We're going to be something that is different than has ever, um, uh, that has ever existed in commercial aviation. You know, you mentioned it, United Next Order. Um, we now have 800 aircraft uh, on order. We're the most in the airline in history has grown. It was Ryanair once added 52 net new airplanes in a single year, um, even with the travails that are happening at Boeing, which are disappointing. Uh, but even with that, we're going to be, we're doing 100 to 120 narrow bodies a year. And at the end of this year, we'll start taking two wide bodies a month. So kind of double the rate that, double the rate of narrow bodies that any other airline has ever done and double the rate of wide bodies all at the same time. So we've How many of you have parents that work for, that are pilots for United? <laughs> I see several of you. Hopefully they love it. <laughs> I'm getting a good smile up here, so that's good. So we've seen a lot of recent advancements in technology and, and also being able to collect better data. Do you think that can help the airline industry uh, better overcome weather delays? Yeah. Or do you think climate <laughs> change 
will worsen weather delays in the future? Both. <laughs> That's not an or. Um, we, we can already see the impact of, of climate change. Um, there's, you know, it, it's, it's simple thermodynamic. All of you have to take thermo, I guess, still. Um, you put more heat and you put more energy in the atmosphere, um, and there's going to be more weather, particularly thunderstorms. Um, and, uh, and we see that uh, all the time. It, it's interesting, though, we've gotten much more precise at weather forecasting, uh, particularly for winter weather. You know, we know, we can usually know where the snow line or the freezing line is, you know, within half a mile. Um, it's really hard when that is right on the airport because the difference of people that fly will know, you know, between 32 and a half degrees, 32 degrees, and 31 and a half degrees is monumental in terms of your ability to operate an airline. Uh, but we've gotten good at that, but we're not good at forecasting thunderstorms. They're, you know, they're much more random. Um, and so I, I think data um, is less, is going to be less impactful on, on meteorolo meteorological um, conditions on a micro level, um, probably be good on a macro level. Um, but there's a lot that's happening with data and data science um, around knowing there. We have so much information on airplanes. Um, they were just swimming in data, uh, a lot of signal, not, not, not a lot of noise, a lot of data, a lot of noise, not enough signal yet. Uh, but we're getting better at, at parsing through that to, to anticipate when an airplane is going to have an issue. So one of the biggest changes you made at, a, at United Airlines is the culture. Can yeah. you talk a bit about the importance of culture in large organizations like United? Yeah. And also, what are some of the changes you've made uh, in regards to United's culture? You know, I'll, I'll take one step back. I think people often confuse leadership and management. Management is about compliance. It's about the checklist. It's about did you show up on time? Did you do everything that you're supposed to do? Leadership is about inspiration and vision. Uh, leaders get people to, wa to want to be great, um, to want to do great things. Um, and that's the only way that you can, can make organizations great. And another way of saying that leadership is culture. Um, and I think the job of a leader, the job of a CEO, um, the, in, the, in the military, the job of you know, a, a wing commander, you know, anyone that's leading, is to, in, is to figure out what the vision and the inspiration that you want people to have. Um, and when I became CEO, I thought this, and now I say it all the time, I, I, and I believe it. I have the easiest job of anyone at United Airlines because I really only have one responsibility, and that is to make our employees proud. Because if they are proud of the airline, then they take care of everything else. They want their fellow employees to feel that way. They want customers to feel that way. And it's so simple. Um, and it's, it, it's great to see that it's working. Um, you know, I spent the morning up, I spend at least, a, you know, I go up every month to the TK, our training center is here in Denver, the biggest training center in the world uh, is in Denver uh, for all of our pilots. And, you know, I can see several hundred of them every time I go. Uh, I do the same thing in Houston, where we do where have 5,000 flight attendants a year go through that facility, and so I can see several hundred every time I go. Um, but it's just it's inspirational to me also to see how they feel. And my guess is if you find some of the people that raise their hands and have you know, parents that fly for United, they can tell you the same thing. Um, people believe in what we're doing. They believe in the vision. They're proud. They want their friends and neighbors to know that they uh, fly for United. Uh, and when that happens, it's just magic, um, and you're on this flywheel. Uh, but culture is the key, um, and focusing on culture. And it's easy to say, maybe it's harder to do. I was at, a, at an event with kind of 100 um, Fortune 500 CEOs, and I said the same thing that all I said to them. All of, we have the easiest job of anyone at our companies because our only job is culture. Um, and afterwards, we had a, a dinner at, at the French Laundry, and I had at least 12 of them come up to me and say, you know, you're right about culture, but it's really hard. <laughs> and so I started finally saying, well, I didn't mean to insult you, but, um, but culture really is what drives everything in an organization. Mm -hmm. So there's been a significant demand of pilots due to a pilot shortage. Yeah. What is United doing to retain pilots and also attract new talent? Yeah, so first at United, we're at the top of the pyramid for pilots, uh, for commercial pilots. So we on our own don't really have... Uh, uh, challenge hiring pilots. Um, regional carriers, smaller carriers do have a challenge, but you know we have a list that's in the tens of thousands um, of pilots who, at our at our standards, that we could hire. Um, that said, um, there is a pilot shortage in the country, um, and I, I think this is true of all corporate leaders. Um, we have we have a bigger obligation than just our companies. Um, we have a the society to the country, um, and I very very much uh, believe that. Um, 
I've also, uh, from the time I uh, got into commercial aviation, wanted to do uh, something to change how, what it ha takes to become a pilot. Most of our pilots are military. Um, historically, the majority were military. Uh, but if you're not military, particularly with the training requirements, 1500 hour rules, it's really, you gotta be wealthy almost um, to get enough hours to become a pilot. It's really hard as a civilian uh, to get enough hours. What that has meant is those barriers to entry mean that 82% of the pilots in the country today are white men. Um, only 18% are women or people of color. And it's not that other people don't have the ability, uh, it's that they don't have the opportunity. Um, and, I, and you also go to these civilian flight schools where they're kind of minimum cost, as many, you know, do the least that you can, um, spend the least that you can, get through the program, skate through your certifications. Um, and so I've always wanted to create something that was better training, more akin to UPT, um, than a traditional flight school um, and, and it gave more people opportunity. And so we've created a program called Aviate Academy. Um, even though we don't have to do it, we take 500 people a year. Uh, by the way, we take fewer than 1% of the applicants uh, because it's such a great career. Um, we're overwhelmed with applicants uh, at that facility. They go to uh, Goodyear, Arizona. Um, we have a flight school there. It used to be the German Air Force where the German Air Force trained people. Um, we bought it, but it has dorms and, you know, a, a little um, you know, place that, you know, cafeteria where we run it at cost, so like your burger is like two bucks. They live in the dorms, you know, their two minute walk to dispatch, you know, when they do their first, when they do their first solo, they get thrown in the swimming pool, you know, it, it's, it's a cultural thing. Uh, we also give them better training, we do upset recovery training, which you never get anywhere else. We give them about twice as many hours as they would get at a civilian flight school, um, and then they're on a path uh, to be a United Airlines pilot, but importantly, um, as, as I think we said in the intro, over half the students are, are women uh, or people of color. And, uh, and I'm really proud of what we're doing there. Our people are really proud uh, of what we're doing there across the board uh, and what it means. I have taken some shots um, from, the, from some of the far right corners of the internet uh, for doing it, but I, I am really proud and we give them better training. And the line, I, I already used it in here, but the line I wind up using with people uh, when they're questioning the safety of these people is, we give them better training than they get anywhere else. The, their pass rate for the FAA test is way higher because we give them better training and we get great people. Um, and so they're meeting all the technical qualifications. Uh, but on a very personal level, you know, to me, I think of this as the first time I got on an airplane in my life after wanting to be a pilot was when I was 17 years old and got on an airplane to come here to the United States Air Force Academy. And we're give, doing the exact same thing uh, and giving the exact same kind of opportunity to these people. So what are some of the qualifications and skills you look for when you hire pilots? And what are some of the qualifi qualifications and skills you look for when you hire leaders? Yeah, um, so pilots, there's obviously, uh, you know, technical abilities is the necessary condition. Um, all of you are, have to take calculus, I'm sure, so it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. Um, and, uh, you know, and we, our, our pilots this year, or last year, uh, ex -mil ex not not cap military. Our, our civilian pilots had um, 4,200 hours on average. Um, so you know we can pick from all the airlines, um, and we do a lot of rigorous testing for technical skills. Uh, but I also have our team. I've asked our team uh, in hiring to look for attitude as a sufficient condition more than anything. People that can work well with other people. People that have a genuine. Um, customer orientation, that care about other people. They're gonna be willing to go the extra mile. And, and this, I'll, I'll tell you a story on this one. This was back when I was president of US Airways. Um, we, uh, I, we started a program for when we hired pilots and I asked them to pick. We had about 20 pilots that said, pilots that everyone likes, that everyone wants to fly with. And I want them to escort um, interviewees through our training facility where they do the simulator tests and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to escort them for a day. And their whole job, they're not really an escort, they're there to just observe and say, is this a person I would want to go on a four day trip with or not? That's your only job. And if they say no, the person is vetoed. Um, and uh, and I had the head of, of, of uh, flight ops who was a great guy, but you know, a Vietnam um, pilot, uh, you know, had flown um, fighter pilots in Vietnam and a, a great guy. Um, like the third day that we had that program going, called me and he said, Kirby, your guy just said no to the best candidate and you have to kill this program. And I'm like, all right, Ed, I'll check, I'll figure it out. 
Um, and I went and, uh, and I called my guy, um, one of these pilots, and, and said, well, what happened? Um, this guy, by the way, was a wing commander, you know, um, and, um, and he said, well, you know, we, I, I don't remember the exact story, but we were going through the lunch line, and the, the woman at the end, you know, not, he, had, he had a drink of some sort, and she knocked it over and spilled it all over his food, and he chewed her out um, for that. And he's like, that's not some, you said to somebody I'd want to spend four days with, and I wouldn't want to. And I called Ed back and said, sorry, Ed, we're not hiring him. Um, and I tell that story because those are the kinds of things that, that matter. You can be in a position, you know, that is somebody that could be in a position of authority and power, but the way you really exercise leadership is making people want to follow you, not making them follow you. And so people that care about other people um, are so much more effective and looking for that quality uh, on top of, of their technical abilities is really what I'm looking for in people. Those are the people that will drive the culture. So I want to shift and talk a bit about how you make decisions. Uh, you, your time as CEO of United Airlines began as the COVID-19 pandem pandemic hit, and you went against what was considered the industry norm. Uh, you kept airlines running, you kept uh, routes going, and you kept pots current. Well, other airlines did a lot. Was this a gamble, or was this a calculated decision? And you know, what gave you the confidence? Yeah, um, I, first I'd say, uh, I, I, you know, I don't mean to sound too egotistical, but I think one of my strengths is making decisions um, in uncertainty. I think it's something you learn here um, as well. Like, you don't always have all the facts, and you, know, you need to make a decision um, and make a decision. I think another th thing that I do that is, I would recommend everyone do, I read extensively. I read about three hours a day. I've done it since I was a kid. I still do it. Um, and that broad set of reading gives you a broader perspective than most people have. Instead of just being narrow in one area, you can correlate things that other people can't have. And the story really for us in COVID starts even earlier, um, four years ago today. I tell our employees we're a four-year-old startup inside a 98-year-old airline because the modern history of United began February 29th of 2020, which is when the then so-called novel coronavirus showed up in northern Italy um, and started killing people. And that morning, uh, I called our chief financial officer and said, Jerry, this is a global pandemic. I don't know what nobody else has figured it out yet, but this is probably going to be deep and last a long time and put real pressure on us. And here's a bunch of stuff we got to do, including go off and raise several billion dollars to give us more runway. Um, and he argued with me for a while and at the end uh, said, uh, well, you're the boss, so I'll do it. Uh, but it's going to take eight to nine weeks. And I said, Jerry, you didn't understand. We have to get it done this week because as soon as the rest of the world figures it out, it'll be impossible. And we went off and raised several billion dollars two days before the NBA uh, walked off the court, and it would have been impossible. And I tell that story because I like the story, A, um, but B, it's also, uh, it sets a tone um, of, of make decisions and do it quick. And when something bad, and the way I say that is, when bad things happen, um, you know, the, I think the best lesson I learned here at the Air Force Academy, by the way, is no excuses, sir. Um, like, it is a life mantra um, to live by. It's a business philosophy. It's a life mantra. Everyone at United Airlines knows it. Nobody succeeds at United, um, at least to get into um, senior levels if they make excuses. Like, I want them to own the problem. Um, I want all of us to own the problem, say what it was, but what we're going to do to fix it. Um, and that philosophy lets you, you know, quickly get to acceptance when things bad happen and figure out what you're going to do uh, to attack the problem and make it better. And so we thought COVID would be deep and last a long time. Nobody else thought that. Um, and what that meant was that when the second wave hit, we were expecting it to be deep. We weren't surprised. We were mentally prepared to be level-headed about it. And at that point, the world, the consensus opinion, all the experts went from everyone at the time thought it was going to be like SARS, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, all the experts said that. And then everyone said, well, travel demand is never going to recover. Uh, it's going to be down 50% permanently. Um, and we thought it would recover. And we were the only ones in the world. United Airlines was literally the only airline, global long-haul airline, only one in the world that did not retire, permanently retire part of our wide-body fleets and start downgrading our pilots. And, and that's the decision, if you make the wrong decision, it takes you a decade to recover from. We were literally the only one. So we questioned ourselves. But then we looked at it and said, this is a once-in-history opportunity. We think we're right and everyone else is wrong. And so we went off and bought 800 airplanes, which, over 800 airplanes. The 800 airplanes, by the way, um, United's the, the largest airline in the world today, and we have like 
825 mainline airplanes. So we were more than doubling the size of what was already um, the largest airline uh, in the world. And, um, and we made that bet during the middle of COVID when everyone else thought travel demand was never going to recover. Um, it's been paying off great. I'm sure it's going to continue to pay off great. Um, but the way you make big, you know, make big deals is make big bets. Um, but make smart bets um, and figure out when the rest of the world has got it wrong and the consensus is wrong. But having that independent opinion, it helps to be well read, um, to be honest, and to be able to say, I think everyone else is wrong, um, and then be willing to make a big bet on it. So one of the big bets uh, and decisions you made, I read about yesterday, you, you, uh, you talked about how United would become the first American airline to resume service to Israel. Yeah. Why now? Uh, you know, we're, we, we've become the flag carrier, really, for the United States. We have more um, international flying than all the rest of the U.S. airlines combined. Um, and, you know, I, I said earlier, I, I feel an obligation to the country. I'm deeply patriotic. Um, but I also also think that it is uh, it is important um, uh, to to represent the country. And you know, during COVID, we were the only airline that maintained links to, between the U.S. and Australia, the U.S. and Israel, the U.S. and Africa, the U.S. and India. Uh, and there's a long list. Um, and we did that in some cases. Like we actually lost a little money on some of those. But you know, we were taking diplomats and their families back and forth. Or when the Delta variant hit in Italy, we were carrying 150 tons of, of medical equipment on every flight um, into India. And the airplanes coming back were filled with uh, U.S. citizens uh, trying to come home. And, and, and so you know, I, I think we have an obligation. Um, we can't do it unless it's safe. Um, and we spent a lot of time, a lot of energy uh, on, on, on Israel making sure it's safe. Um, but it was also important to, to me that it's the right thing to reestablish um, those links. Um, you know, our government wants us to do it, uh, and, um, and so we're the first to do it, and we'll start here in a week and a half. Awesome. Uh, so United recently announced a big expansion into Denver International Airport. What does Denver mean for United's expan expansion strategy? Yeah, look, we're, we're, we're expanding everywhere. Um, we're going to double the size of the airline, you know, what was already the biggest airline uh, kind of by the end of the decade. So we're expanding at all of our hubs and even some places uh, that aren't hubs. But Denver is, um, I, I told, I, I did a thing with the mayor this morning, a bunch of TV um, for a ribbon cutting for uh, more simulators. Um, and I said there, like, much like your kids, you're not I'm not allowed to have a favorite hub. We have seven hubs at United. I'm not allowed to have a favorite hub, but I love Colorado. Um, and. Uh, uh, I do. I have a house out here, too. Um, I love being out here. Uh, Denver is our, by number of flights, our biggest hub. Uh, it is our fastest growing hub. It is our most profitable hub. Um, it's a place we can expand. It's a place where, you know, the community is very supportive. We can get things done quickly. There, you know, when I'm trying to get stuff done in California, I mean, it's decades um, uh, of time uh, to get something done, if you ever get it done. Um, and, uh, and that makes a big difference. Um, and so it's a great place to grow. Um, it does really well. Um, customers are responding. Uh, we used to, you know, we for a decade had lower market share than one other airline um, by quite a bit. And, uh, and now coming out of the pandemic, we we're quite a bit ahead of them. Uh, number one, customers are choosing us. Our people are doing a great job um, to get customers to choose us. Um, and we're feeling pretty good about the future of Denver, all of our hubs, but, but Denver's gonna grow a lot. So I assume as CEO, you make a lot of uh, de uh, decisions. What decisions do you think can be delegated to somebody below you, and what decisions do you make yourself? Uh, actually, one of the secrets of being an effective CEO is you don't make a lot of decisions. Um, in fact, I make one or two decisions a year, really. Um, um, they tend to be big. They tend to matter a lot. Um, I do much more trying to influence decisions. Um, that's actually been one of the less leadership lessons that that was a little hard to learn, but once it clicked with me, I realized how much more powerful it was. Like seeing something where somebody is making something that you think is the wrong decision, and so saying, just do this instead. Like trying to, and even letting them do it, even if you think it's wrong, and letting them do it, and then asking them, what did you think about that? And getting them to come to the idea. You know, there's nothing as powerful as a, a leader in decision making as getting someone that works on your team to get to an answer that you think is the right answer, and it's their idea. Um, and making it their idea is so much more powerful. 
Um, and so to be an effective leader, I think if you're making all the decisions, you're not going to be an effective leader because then no one else will make decisions. But creating an environment where people um, get to the right decision and feel comfortable taking risks and making decisions um, is much more effective. So you've been known to be a good blackjack and poker player. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been said that you should always split aces and eights. And the math, the math supports this. It does. When you make decisions, do you always follow the math um, in blackjack or in business? Yeah, uh, in blackjack, I always followed the math. Um, and I got, uh, I got barred at pretty much every casino. In fact, I was back there this weekend. I was for the Super Bowl. And now I play, I've, I've played play poker my whole life too. And it's super fun to play at the high stakes poker games where everyone is a professional except for me um, in Vegas. But I was playing at one at the Super Bowl and they, you know, if you're buying for that amount, they make you give them your ID for tax reasons. And, um, and I'm playing poker and um, somebody comes over and they give you, they print up one of the little cards for me. Um, and, and, but he said, and Mr. Kirby, we just want to make sure you know you're not allowed to play blackjack in our casino. I'm like, dude, it was 15 years ago, <laughs> but I'm still not allowed to play blackjack. They still know. Um, but uh, but though, but blackjack, you always follow the math. Poker, if you always follow the math, you're in trouble. Um, and in the real world, if you try to always follow the math, you're going to be wrong, mostly because you don't know the math. Um, and like, I actually, I'm very analytical. I'm good at math. I am very analytical. But I hate spreadsheets, because um, most spreadsheets are a tautology. Um, if, if you don't know what a tautology is, go look it up. But essentially, a tautology is the assumptions that you put into the spreadsheet define the answer that comes out at the bottom of the spreadsheet or the analysis. Um, and so what you should spend all your time thinking about is the assumptions. Like, what am I assuming? And am I right or wrong on those assumptions? And say, if this is right, if X, Y, Z happened, then this is the outcome. But where you make the mistake is getting the assumptions wrong. Um, and, and that's where people should spend their time. And most decisions in the real world are not mathematical. They cannot be reduced to a mathematical certainty. And if you try, you'll make mistakes um, because your assumptions will be wrong. And you won't be able to test the assumptions. And if you don't know where the weaknesses are in the analysis, you're prone to make mistakes. So do you ever make like uh, gut decisions just based off of what you, how you feel? Yeah. I, I mean. Yes, um, I, I am intuitive. If you take the kind of t personality testing, um, I'm very much the intuitive type that makes what you call gut decisions. But they're gut decisions based on a lot of data and knowing. Like, I know more factual information about what is happening at United Airlines than anyone. Um, I mean, I know the numbers. I look at the data. I know what's going on. I'm not making individual decisions about it. But all that's informing your opinion so that when the big decisions come up, you can make decisions quickly. I mean, going back to you know the pandemic um, when it started on February 29th, everything I was reading and paying attention to and following was wondering what was going to happen. And so the moment I read that article, I said, "This is a global pandemic," um, and nobody else thought that. Um, but it seemed obvious to me uh, that it was. And and so it's not really just a gut decision based on how you feel. It's a gut informed by lots of information and data that you just collect until your brain puts the connections together and you need it. So my last question for you is, what advice do you have uh, for cadets as they prepare uh, to enter new leadership roles in the military and beyond? Yeah, um, look, uh, when, I, when I graduated, um, I was one of those that sort of sarcastically, you know, the rear view mirror um, and didn't appreciate uh, how much I'd learned here. Um, it was one of the most impactful things uh, in my life. Um, and I uh, owe this place uh, a huge debt of gratitude uh, for what it did uh, for me. It gave me discipline um, that I didn't have and otherwise would not have had. Um, you know, it taught me no excuses, sir, um, which was a great lesson. It taught me the sandwich method. Do you guys still do the sandwich method on feedback? If you're giving somebody negative feedback, tell them something really good. Then you give the negative feedback and end with something uh, really good. You guys don't do that anymore. Um, it was, it's a great lesson in life for a bunch of things. When we were cadets, they'd, somebody, come, uh, upper class, would come up to yell at you and he'd say, your belt buckle looks good. They'd scream at you and then they'd laugh, say, your shoelaces look good. Um, so they didn't do it the correct way. But if you do it the correct way, it's good. But there's a lot of lessons like that. Uh, that you're learning here. Um, and the experience, it's, it's so different than what other people are doing at a traditional college. Getting to go 
out and fly an F-4 during the summer, um, you know, getting to go through the ops programs that you do in Siri and Jack's Valley and all the other stuff that you do are creating such unique experiences. Um, and so appreciate them later and realize how it gives you an advantage uh, compared to, to other people. Um, and as you're leading, think of yourselves as, as leaders. That's really the biggest advice. Um, and leaders are about, are about people. Leadership is about people. It's about inspiring people. It's about motivating people. Um, it's, it's not about telling them what to do. Um, if you're having to tell someone what to do, you should consider that a failure. If it gets to the point where you're having to tell someone what to do, um, as opposed to get them to lead themselves um, to the right answer. So think of yourselves as leaders who are about inspiring um, and creating vision for people. I also want to say thank you to all of you that are cadets um, and, uh, and everyone that's in the military uh, in, in a world that is dangerous, and we still see that uh, now, uh, for raising your hands and volunteering uh, to do this, uh, to, to make sacrifices in, in the short term um, and to make potentially larger sacrifices. Um, I, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, most people do, um, but I also understand what you're doing uh, and applaud you for it and appreciate you very much. So thank you for what you're doing uh, more than anything. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Mr. Kirby and Cadet Yuan, thank you for sharing your conversation with us this afternoon. Mr. Kirby, your experiences and perspective certainly speak to how we can embrace culture and empower people. On behalf of the United States Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this gift of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made from marble from the TZO. As you know, this is foundational to us because all cadets have had to run the marble strips during their mm -hmm. freshman year. We hope this brings back memories of your time at USAFA and that you will it look does. on this <laughs> and remember your NCLS experience fondly. Thank you. 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 Awesome. Okay, yeah. Where's the camera? Oh, right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. This concludes our session. We welcome feedback on your NCLS experience. Please rate this session on the event app. Finally, we encourage you to stop by our testimonial booth this afternoon on the south side of the Arnold Hall foyer, where you can record your thoughts on NCLS 2024. Thank you, and have a great day. <laughs>